Today we're going to talk about infinite limits. My name is Tuesday J. Johnson. I'm a lecturer at University of Texas El Paso and an assistant professor at Doña Ana Community College. This is for Math 1411 Calculus, Chapter 1, Limits and Their Properties from Larson's 11th edition calculus text. Section 1.5 is infinite limits. So let's start with a definition. Let's let f be a function that is defined at every real number in some open interval containing c, except possibly at c itself. Remember with limits, we don't care what happens at c, we care what happens near c. So the statement, limit as x approaches c of f of x equals infinity, means that for each capital M bigger than zero, there exists a delta so that f of x is larger than M whenever x is close enough to c. And by close enough, I mean its distance is within delta. So f of x could get as large as we want as long as we get x and c close enough, and close enough is defined by our delta value. Similarly, the statement limit as x approaches c of f of x equals negative infinity means that for each negative number, capital N less than zero, there exists a delta where the y values of the function are smaller than any negative number that we choose. As long as x and c are close enough, close enough being defined by delta. To define the infinite limit from the left, we replace, instead of looking at zero less than the absolute value of x minus c less than delta, we just take a little bit of delta away from c. So from the left, from the right, uh, notes, having a limit equal to infinity does not mean the limit exists. In fact, it means the limit is unbounded and therefore does not exist. If you're using the WebAssign homework system by Cengage, if the limit is infinity, you should enter that for your answer and not does not exist. I haven't found great consistency, but in at least section 1.5, we're looking at infinite limits. So let's put in the infinity or the negative infinity if that is in fact the limit. So the limit from the right has to equal the limit from the left and so on as we had before. Vertical asymptotes. Now we can have our definition. If f of x approaches infinity, positive or negative, as x approaches c from the right or the left, then the line, the vertical line, x equals c, is a vertical asymptote of the graph. And here's a theorem about that. Let f and g be continuous on an open interval containing c. If f of c is not zero, but g of c is zero, all right, so the numerator is not zero, but the denominator is, and there exists an open interval containing c, such that the denominator is not always zero, but it might be zero at c in this particular interval, then the graph has a vertical asymptote. And we've seen this informally in pre-calculus. If the denominator is zero and the numerator is not, we defined a vertical asymptote, but now we can see that because we have limit definitions that give us exact information as to what's going on there. So let's find the vertical asymptote, if any. We know for this particular function, the numerator is zero when x is zero. We know the denominator is never zero. Since the denominator is never zero, there's no vertical asymptote. Why is the denominator never zero? Take any real number and square it. It'll be zero or positive. When I add four, it'll now be four or higher in the denominator, therefore never zero. H of s equals 2s minus 3 over s squared minus 25. I know my numerator is 0 at 3 halves. My denominator is 0 at both positive and negative 5. Therefore, the vertical asymptotes are s equals 5 and s equals negative 5. Very important here. Vertical asymptotes are always equations of lines. s equals 5, s equals negative 5. Never just values, s equals plus or minus 5. This is a value. This is where the denominator is 0. Asymptotes are equations of lines. So you have to have your variable, an equal sign, and something on the right. For the function g of x equals x cubed plus 1 over x plus 1, Notice that when we factor using the sum of cubes formula, x plus 1 times x squared, that is incorrect. How about I write the correct information in here? Uh, this is a negative sign. So my bad on that. Got to fix that typing. 
Both the numerator and denominator are zero when x is negative one. This is not a vertical asymptote, however. This is a removable discontinuity. Notice that we both the numerator and denominator are zero. Removable discontinuity, not an asymptote. The limit still exists. Now, this is a homework problem from Larson's 11th edition, and it's always given my students headaches. So let's make sure we take care of that before you start looking at your homework. If we have h of t equals t squared minus 2t over t to the fourth minus 16, I'm going to completely factor the numerator, t times t minus 2. Completely factor the denominator, t to the fourth minus 16 factors as t squared plus, excuse me, t squared minus 4 times t squared plus 4. And then I further factor t squared minus 4 into its difference of squares, a t minus 2, t plus 2. Now I know the numerator is 0 at 0 and at 2. The denominator is 0 at 2 and at negative 2. This tells us that t equals 2 is not a vertical asymptote. This is a removable discontinuity. However, t equals negative 2 is a vertical asymptote. Again, vertical asymptote equation of a line. Our input variable, an equal sign, and the value on the right. You must have an equation of a line for vertical asymptotes. Finding the vertical asymptotes of f of x equals secant of pi x, we'll first rewrite it in quotient form, 1 over cosine of pi x. Nice little reciprocal identity here. We know that the numerator is never 0. We know the denominator is 0, so zeros of cosine happen at pi over 2, 3 pi over 2, 5 pi over 2, the negatives, always the half pi's. So when pi x is pi over 2 plus any pi multiple after that, for any arbitrary integer n. So we know if we solve for x, we divide pi um, on both sides of the equation. We know that the vertical asymptotes for secant of pi x will be at 1 half plus n for all integers n. Find the limit if it exists. Tables are great if you don't have access to a graph. If I'm looking at the limit as x approaches 1 from the right of 2 plus x over 1 minus x, I could substitute values that get closer and closer to 1, but I'm only looking from the right. And as I put 1.1 in, I'll get a negative 3.1, a negative 301, a negative 3001. It looks like these values are blowing up. As y gets large and negative, so not what I want to say, y gets large and negative as we read the table from right to left, getting closer and closer to 1 from the right. And similarly with the graph, thanks to Desmos.com and its graphing utility, as x gets closer and closer to 1 from the right, my y values are going to negative infinity. Numerically, graphically, the information is the same. The limit as x approaches 4 from the right of x squared over x squared plus 16. Don't forget your basics. 4 is in the domain of this rational function. So in order to evaluate the limit, whether it's from the right, from the left, or just a limit in general, all we do is substitute. 4 squared is 16. 4 squared is still 16. 16 over 32 is 1 half. We could have used a table or graph, but when you can, just evaluate the function to find the limit. The limit as x approaches pi over 2 from the right of negative 2 over cosine of x is the limit as x approaches pi over 2 from the right of negative 2 secant x. Now, if you prefer to look at it in a quotient, that's fine. If you prefer to deal with secant, that's fine also. If we try to evaluate here on the left, we'll get negative 2 over 0. But that doesn't necessarily mean our solution is negative infinity. Negative 2 over 0 could be positive or negative infinity, as it turns out. If we try a table, we realize we're in radians, and what does close to pi over 2 look like when you're guessing values? No idea. So let's take a look at the graph. If I graph the negative 2 secant of x, and I'm looking as x approaches pi over 2 from the right, our results look like they're positive infinity. Why is that? It's because the values of cosine on the right of pi over 2 are negative. So a negative 2 over some negative values getting super close to 0, negative over a negative ends up in a positive. So a little algebraic or trigonometric analysis would work as well. Some properties of infinite limits. 
Arithmetic with infinity can be a little challenging at times, so let's let C and L be real numbers and let F and G be functions such that the limit as x approaches C of F of X equals infinity and the limit as x approaches C of G of X equals L. So infinity for the limit of F, a real number for the limit of G. Infinity plus or minus a number, still going to give us infinity. The product, the limit as x approaches c of f of x times g of x, if the limit l is positive, infinity times a positive number will be positive, and infinity times a negative number, if your limit uh, for g is negative, will get negative infinity. Quotients, any real number l divided by a value going to infinity is zero. If you have seven M&Ms, an entire campus shows up and wants a piece of those seven M&Ms, essentially everybody gets nothing. Similar properties hold for one-sided limits and for functions uh, which the limit f of, uh, of f of x as x approaches c is negative infinity. So I only define them for positive infinity, but similar definitions can be made when x uh, approaches c of f of x equals negative infinity. Once again, thank you to Desmos.com and their free online graphing utility for the graphs. They look amazing.